Good evening. My name is Anshu Grover and I am a member of the Art Society Committee here at the Granite Club. It's a pleasure to join you today in your homes and share a little bit about this beautiful painting with you. This painting, which is called White Pines and hangs in the St. Clair Room at the southeast end of our club, was painted in 1905 by a prominent Canadian artist named Elizabeth McGilvery Knowles. Born in 1866 in Ottawa, Elizabeth was from an affluent family and was the niece of a very famous artist by the name of Frederick Marlett Bell Smith. Like most young girls from affluent families in the 19th century, Elizabeth was encouraged by her parents to pursue the arts as a sign of her pedigree and her stature as a refined woman. They encouraged her to play a musical instrument, but Elizabeth's true passion was painting, as was evidenced by her love for watching on hours as her uncle painted in his studio. It was in fact her uncle who convinced her parents to let her pursue her passion for painting and go to art school in Toronto. While at art school, Elizabeth fell in love with one of her professors, Fercar McGilvery Knowles, a recent widow and fellow painter, and they got married in 1890. After marriage, Elizabeth and her husband moved to Europe where they studied and traveled extensively. After several years, they returned to Toronto and worked and lived in a studio which quickly became a gathering spot for fellow artists. By 1920, she and her husband had moved to New York and she spent the rest of her life living in the United States until her death in 1928. Elizabeth died at the age of 62 while at her summer home in Riverton, New Hampshire. Elizabeth McGilvery Knowles attained considerable acclaim during her lifetime. She was a well-known miniature and landscape painter with a specific focus on wildlife and rural landscapes, as is evident in this painting, White Pines. She was considered to be of the Romantic School, which you can also see in this painting, and she worked primarily with oil on canvas in order to be able to showcase the rich textures and nuances of Mother Nature. She was particularly well known for a deep study series she did on poultry, of all things, in which she rendered beautiful paintings of chickens in farms and rural barn settings. In 1908, Elizabeth was elected an associate of the Royal Canadian Academy. She was also a member of several prominent societies, including the Ontario Society of Artists, the National Association of Women Painters and Sculptors in New York, the Pennsylvania Society of Miniature Painters, the Brooklyn Society of Miniature Painters, the Washington Water Club, the American Watercolor Society, and the League of American Pen Women. Elizabeth's work was exhibited in many prominent galleries throughout North America through her lifetime and beyond. And today her work is held in a number of prominent public collections, including the National Gallery of Canada, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the Agnes Etherington Center of Queen's University, and of course, many private collections, such as our own at the Granite Club. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 2022 Art and Wine Society Night. Again, unfortunately, albeit virtually like last year, however, we're going to take a journey through five fantastic pieces of art here at the club and all done by by very notable female artists so that's our theme tonight so every year when I'm asked to do this it's always a, a real pleasure for me I find uh, it's a lot of fun um, but it's also quite challenging because I have to think about you know what do these art pieces speak to me about and it can be in the art itself it can be something about the artists themselves it could be about the time period that they actually work in and so it's always a lot of fun and challenging so let's go to our first painting uh, here we have White Pines, which was done by Elizabeth McGilvery Knowles, uh, who was a landscape artist and did a lot of rural settings. And if you think rural, I mean, automatically you think viticulture, they go hand in hand. And here we're going to talk about an interesting wine that has actually a 4,000 year history. Because when I was thinking about this, white pines, I mean, we use oak uh, trees to make oak barrels, um, but pine is not something generally used. You don't see pine oak barrels anywhere. But where we do find pine is in the 4,000 year history of Greek Retsina. And so tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about Retsina. So it is a very traditional wine of Greece. It has its own sort of designation of origin, which means you can't find Retsina on any label anywhere in the world. 
And the, it's really grown, uh, it can be made throughout the country, but it's generally found in that core area sort of uh, around Athens. Um, if you've ever been to Greece, to Athens, to the islands, no doubt you've had some retsina most likely very bad, but there's been a real renaissance in the last sort of decade as younger producers come up and take over their family estates and are really interested in trying to create something of very good quality out of this very traditional wine. Now, Retsina is um, made from the Aleppo pine tree. And so you take the sap and what it was originally used for was back in ancient times, you stored wine in these terracotta amphora and they could have some cracks and things so you would line the inside of the amphora with this resin um, and also you would use it to seal the lid because oxygen is really the death to wine it really will destroy it very very quickly and so um, it's something that you uh, that the greeks used quite often and continue to um, up until probably the turn of the, the uh, 20th century, Greece was still fairly agrarian and it was not uncommon for families, you know, to buy bulk retsina from their local taverns and even add a little bit more resin into it. And so what you do is during the process, you pick the grapes and you crush them up and you, uh, you put them in a fermentation tank and you add about one kilogram of the resin to about 100 liters of must, which is basically what we call wine before it's been fermented. And so the main grape varieties that we find in, uh, in its use, and it's predominantly a white wine like you can see here, is uh, Savatiano and Roditis, which are two native Greek, uh, Greek, Greek grape varieties. And so this is from Kortaki, which is one of the, well, it is the largest Greek uh, producer. And it goes back to 1895 when Vasilis Kortakis uh, founded, the, uh, founded the estate. And today it's now run by the fourth generation. So it has a very distinct yellow label, which um, they created over 50 years ago. And it has remained virtually unchanged. And since, uh, you know, at its height, there was about 60 million bottles of uh, Retsina from Kortaki sold alone in the yellow label. And so what can we expect from it? Well, it's, you know, this is a really great little example. It's got a little bit of a deeper color, but the first thing you're going to get on the nose is you're going to get that, that pine aromatic. It's really fresh and vibrant. And uh, beneath that, you're going to get this sort of lemony, herbal sort of character. So it goes really well with, uh, with Greek cuisine, obviously, in so many places around the world, the food and the wine go together. Um, it's not something we find often here in, uh, in our market, uh, but Kortaki is certainly, if you're looking for something interesting to try, uh, Kortaki, uh, the yellow label Retsina, is something to look for. Good evening, everyone. My name is Margaret Steed, and I'm a member of the Art Society here at the Granite Club. Again this year, I chose a piece to speak about that I knew nothing about and an artist I wanted to know more about. I can remember several years ago walking into the bistro where this piece hangs and looking at it and thinking, huh? But with a smile on my face. Nothing Never Wins by artist Kelly Mark, 2011. Kelly Mark was born in Welland, Ontario in 1967. She now lives and works in Toronto. She obtained her art certificate from the Dundas School of Art in 1991. She then went on to obtain her Bachelor of Fine Arts with a minor in art history from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design. She graduated in 1994. Kelly Mark is represented by Olga Corporate Gallery here in Toronto. In December, when I realized I would speak, be speaking to this piece, I attended the gallery and was quite pleased to find out that Kelly Mark had a show on at the time. It was quite fun and quite fanciful. I had the privilege of speaking to Shelley Cassidy McIntosh, the director of the gallery, and was able to obtain her insight into Kelly Mark. Shelley describes Mark's work as conceptual contemporary, avant-garde, that Ma Mark is a master at witty word play. Take this piece, nothing never wins. Or could it be something always wins or something always loses? Whatever it is, it's fun and fanciful. So you ask why neon? 
And I'm going to read you a, a bit from the write-up that is right beside the piece that I encourage you to read when you come back to the club. The medium is crucial to the work's meaning. These quick, humorous messages are given permanence in the mass-produced artifice of glowing neon, creating a delicate balance between cold commercial pessimism and the levity of shared human experience. While it may be easy to interpret Mark's sentiment as pessimism, it can also be interpreted as a winking commentary on conceptual art. I think the most important word there is winking. She really wants to make you smile. Ironically, a few years ago, I attended Art Toronto, and walking into the corporate booth, I saw a piece that immediately engaged me, and I bought. It was acrylic and it was a series of words that hung perpendicular to the floor. The words were newfangled, whatchamacallit, doohickey, thingamabob. It made me smile because these were all words that my grandfather, who was born in Newfoundland, recited to us as kids. Therefore, I do feel that Mark challenges the engagement. To look at words in the world through different lenses. She wants to stop and think and have a reaction. Mark uses different mediums for her work, including neon, such as this one, acrylic, such as my piece, letraset, sculpture, performance art, to name a few, with each medium used to always challenge our thoughts. I encourage you to look at her website, kellymark.com. It is very interesting and very complete. Kelly Mark is represented in the public connections, collections of the National Gallery of Canada, the Canada Council Art Bank, Canadian Foreign Affairs, the Art Gallery of Ontario, and the Granite Club. Nothing Never Wins by Kelly Mark, 2011. Thank you for listening. Over to you, Brent. next piece is arguably one of the most inquired about pieces in the entire club. It's very rare that uh, members when they come in here don't ask me what this piece means because when you think about it and look at it, it's very unlike any of the other art pieces here at the club. Uh, and it says something that really makes you stop to think or if you're not going to stop to think about it, it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, it was very interesting to hear um, Mark Steed talk about sort of the flip side of that coin and that is that something always wins. And so when I looked at this piece, uh, I was like, oh, what am I gonna talk about here? I mean, is it about what I see in the piece? Is it about what the piece says? And I took a little decision to go a little bit behind the piece. And this is a neon piece, and neon is an inert noble gas in that it doesn't react with anything. And if you've ever been on a wine tour, you may or may not have seen um, these gas tanks in a winery because there are certain gases that can be used and are used during the viticulture and the winemaking process. And the first one is nitrogen. And nitrogen is used to displace oxygen, which as I mentioned in our first piece is the enemy of wine. And so what this nitrogen does is it basically will blanket any sort of empty spaces, whether it's in a stainless steel tank or whether it's in a bottle. And so a winemaker will use this during the production process. The other way nitrogen is used is that it's very important in uh, the vineyards in that the vine requires nitrogen in order to make green matter, which ultimately produces the grapes. The other gas that can be used as well is carbon dioxide. And we think, oh, carbon dioxide, wow, it's the leading cause of global warming. Um, but carbon dioxide is a byproduct of fermentation. And so when you've been walking through, if you've ever had the opportunity during harvest, you have these open tanks and you have these beautiful smells in the winery, but the actual tanks are bubbling because the fermentation process is actually giving off some of that CO2. Now CO2 is also used in the vineyard um, as in its sort of solid form in dry ice. So producers will use uh, dry ice and they'll put them in the picking bins um, because grapes are not automatically transported right to the winery at harvest time. Uh, and so this dry ice will actually keep the grapes cool, but it also sort of retard the oxygen pr oxygenation process, which begins to attack the grapes as soon as they are picked. Uh, another gas that is also used is uh, argon. 
And argon is used, um, it's, it's a little bit more expensive, so it's not used as much as, say, nitrogen is. Um, but it's very interesting because argon is used in this um, wine um, mechanism called the Corvin. And the Corvin is this machine, it basically sits on top of a wine, and it allows you to extract wine out of the bottle without ever removing the cork. And it was invented by this American inventor. And it's a really great way if you're you know, not a big drinker and you just want to have a glass of something nice, that you can actually Coravin the wine. And it can stay really fresh up to a couple of years. I've had Coravin wines here at the club that we opened uh, several years ago. And we popped the corks. And the wines have been very fresh. So you've, here we've got some uses for three gases. Um, and so the wine I picked today is a wine from a very small young producer called Domaine des Arts. And uh, young Pierre Leroche is um, about 35, and the first vintage that he made was in 2010. Now, Pierre's father uh, mainly grew cereals, and for years also uh, sent grapes and grew grapes for the cooperative La Chablisienne. So uh, Domaine des Hades is from Chablis, which is the northernmost region in Burgundy. And here we're talking just about Chardonnay very unoaked, dry, sort of steely styles. These are a world away from California Chardonnays. And so I picked this wine really because when I look at this piece and it's got this bright white luminescence, if you've ever been to Chablis, the vineyards here are really, really noticeably white. And that comes from this very special Kimmeridgian soil, which is a limestone and clay, but it's mixed with these fossilized oyster shells. And this soil is about 150 years old because at one point in time, this area was covered by an inland sea. And so you have this really great soil that gives this really wonderful minerality, a very textural thing that we talk about when we talk about wine. And so Chablis is one of the, one of the great regions in, uh, in really in the world. And this Domaine des Hat, these styles are very crisp and dry. Like I said, there's virtually no oak on this wine. You're really getting a lot of this sort of uh, green fruits, green apples, lemons, because it's really quite far north. Chablis is only about 185 kilometers southeast of Paris. And in fact, it's almost closer to Champagne, just to the north of it, than it is to the rest of Burgundy, about 150 kilometers to the south, where we find some of the great white wine villages like Meursault, chassin mont rocher pouligny mont rocher and so this is a straight Chablis. So in Burgundy, there are four quality levels, basically, when it comes to Chablis. One, we have Petit Chablis. These vineyards are sort of higher. They're, they don't have quite the same amount of this Kimmeridgian soils. And so they don't make wines quite as uh, intense and complex. Then we move up to Chablis, which is where a lot of producers, most of the wines we find uh, are Chablis, um, because all of, these, all of this area is not very big. You know, there's only, um, I think, about 5,000 uh, um, hectares that are produced where you can actually grow, uh, grow you know, Chablis and Chardonnay. Um, and so when you move up the next quality tier, you have Premier Cru. So you're talking really about 41 villages that are authorized to make this Premier Cru. And these are the villages that have historically produced a better wine than, say, just a village-level Chablis. And then at the very top of the pyramid, you've got Grand Cru Chablis. And there's only about 2% of the production comes from Grand Cru. In Chablis itself, it is actually seven different what they call climat, or sort of named vineyards, but it's all on one hill. It has the most sort of, of this Kimmeridgian soil. It has a perfect sort of south, southwestern exposure to catch the heat of the sun during the entire day, which is very important when we're this far north. So, there's two concepts I really wanted to talk about, and one is the use of these inert gases in, in winemaking and viticulture, and the other thing is really just the Chablis um, that I really got when I looked at this wine. It's got a little bit of a coldness to it. It's a little bit stark, which is what you find in these wines, but you give it a little bit of time in, uh, in a glass or in a decanter, and it really opens up beautifully. everyone. My name is Minakshi Sibyl and I am delighted to present Dark Cluster by Shirley Wittesillo. Most Granite Club members recognize this monumental and explosive bold red canvas which hangs in the 1875 gallery. Dark Cluster is a 2004 oil painting by veteran Canadian artist and educator Shirley Wittesillo who lives and works locally out of North York, Ontario. 
Largely self-taught, Witticello was deeply influenced by American modernist Milton Avery and studied briefly at the Ontario College of Art under French abstractionist Francois Thébault. Her work has been exhibited extensively nationally and internationally and is in the collections of the National Gallery of Canada, the Art Gallery of Ontario and the Museums of Contemporary and Fine Arts in Montreal. She has been a recipient of the Toronto Visual Arts, Gershon Iskowitz and Governor General Awards. She is represented by Toronto gallerist Susan Hobbs, who in fact says that this piece was an intended New York commission, but then acquired by the Granite in 2006. What we have here are black circular forms floating in a glowing shimmering field of fiery cadmium red light, evidently the artist's favorite color. Dreamlike seductive circles emerge from and dissolve into rich murky depths quite casually and effortlessly. The painting itself is hard to interpret as each of us sees different things in this piece. The Globe and Mail calls Witticello the sultry mistress of the art of peekaboo who alternates between lush washes of color and pattern and ethereal swipes of obscuring neutrals. This dance of absence and presence, bold and shy, is created by a deliberate transfer process. Her faint haphazard marks and gestures are actually the result of a very intentional working practice. She applies fabrics, rollers, stencils and screens to both conceal and reveal her subject and form. Her paintings are an exercise in both control and chance as the rupture through the picture plane is in fact the unspeakable directive to the viewer on how to look. A figurative and abstract painter, Witticello works in oil and acrylic, enamel and gauche, photo emulsion and silk screen. Art historians believe that she has both inherited and shifted the practice of painting. She creates unpredictable, challenging, highly sophisticated and sensual works in which multiple levels of reality intersect. Until the 1990s, she investigated the complex themes of media, pop culture, urbanism, and Toronto's unbridled real estate development. Over time, her art has dramatically simplified and become more abstract. She loosely brushes the picture plane in a single color to ground the surface on which a few lines or strokes of a contrasting color conjure an elusive image. She uses interference pigments to refract light and suffuse the painting with dynamic variations. These later compositions have very little content and become presences in themselves. I have often wondered if dark cluster depicts a mobile or a constellation and examining Witticello's style has demystified it somewhat for me. It becomes clear that there is tremendous complexity and careful balance in this deceptively economical, masterful painting. There is purposeful luminosity and brilliant movement in both her virtuoso brush strokes and the under and over painting of the circles. The subject becomes less important as she very skillfully draws the viewer in to engage with the physicality of the piece. To close, Curator Sarah Milroy says that uncertainty and ambiguity are Witticello's favorite terrain. Her paintings are delicate, spare, and almost incomplete, as if to show how few marks she can make to summon up a whole world. Thank you. So here we are standing in arguably one of the statement pieces here at the Granite Club, and that is Dark Clusters by Shirley Witticello. And if you look at this painting and where it's located in the club, it can only be on this one wall. Coming down through this gallery, it is the most heavily trafficked part of the club. And often I see people either stopping to look at it, or certainly around the holidays, we have lots of people looking to take pictures in front of it. And it's a very bold piece, certainly with its striking red colors and these black dots. And we did this piece a number of years ago, and I didn't want to replicate what I had done before, so I thought about, what can I do here? And so I went to this notion of uh, 
terroir. I'm going to talk about that in just a second, but this art piece, you know, has a real elusive sort of quality to it. You've got these striking dots, but then they sort of merge back into this murkiness. And I came across a quote from Heather White, who's an art critic, who said that Witasalo aspires to be a sort of like a photographer in that she's a painter's painter with a photographer's aspiration to be neutral. And that's very important in this idea of terroir. And terroir has no English translation, um, but really it means somewhereness. It's like, why do the wines that we do in Niagara differ uh, than the wines that they do in Napa, or that they do in, say, the Barossa Valley in Australia, or in Bordeaux in France? And so today we're going to talk a little bit about Pinot Noir, which is called the heartbreak grape for good reason. It is very difficult to grow. It doesn't do well in very many places around the world, but it's sort of the holy grail for winemakers and that everybody wants to try their hand in it. Uh, its ancestral home is Burgundy in France, but it's also grown in a number of places uh, that do it very well. Oregon, uh, for me, outside of Burgundy is probably the second greatest place. Uh, California, in some cooler climates, in Sonoma makes some really lovely wines. Uh, and really further south in Santa Barbara makes some uh, excellent wines down there. But also in um, New Zealand, Otago and Martinboro, which is sort of just north of Wellington, which is the capital of New Zealand. Uh, but also in Germany. Uh, we don't see a lot of German wines in there. They call them Spatburgunder uh, because literally the big cities of Frankfurt and Munich, they take everything that's, that's made. And so what is it about Pinot Noir that makes it so difficult? Well, it's really a challenge to grow in the vineyard. Uh, it buds early, which means in, in cool climates, it really could be subjected to some spring frost, uh, in which case you're going to lose all the crop that has, uh, that has started. Once the grapevine buds, then it's very susceptible to these spring frosts. Um, and so it needs, it's kind of like the Goldilocks of wine in a way, in that it doesn't like a lot of heat, it doesn't like it too cold, so kind of just in the middle. In fact, it likes more warmth than actual sunshine. Um, it is a variety that's really prone to mutation. Uh, there are about a thousand different clones that you can make Pinot Noir from, um, but we have a few very common ones that we find around the world. Uh, and certain, certain uh, regions where, let's say, these uh, you know, uh, varieties showed up uh, sort of what they call as suitcase clones, meaning they were smuggled in, most likely obviously from Burgundy. Uh, so in California, um, there are these heritage clones or these suitcase clones that are being used, uh, but also in about the late 80s, the University of Dijon uh, released what's called the Dijon clones to the world. And basically, you can create a clone, you propagate it because the vine will show certain sort of strengths. And so these Dijon clones will have certain sort of characteristics, whether it's 114, 115 for their uh, finesse and their elegance, or whether it's 777 for a little bit of its tannic prowess sort of thing. And so a winemaker, when they're, when they're making these wines or planting these vineyards, they can put a variety of different clones in there to get this sort of melange of, of, uh, of clones to give you a sort of more of a complex style. Uh, so the wine that we have today is the La Fonde Pinot Noir from the Santa Rita Hills in California. Now, uh, if you ever saw the movie Sideways, which was a really funny movie, it came out in 2004, about two buddies uh, from LA who go up for a sort of a bachelor's weekend and some really uh, interesting things uh, you know, unfold and they take in a lot of wineries and things like that. So Santa Barbara is uh, relatively new on the landscape. I mean, the first vineyard was only planted in 1971 called the Sanford and Benedict. And uh, this area is about an hour north of uh, Santa Barbara proper. As you go up the 101, you come to Buellton, and then you head west out towards the coast. And so what's interesting about the Santa Rita Hills is that it is one of the only um, areas in uh, North America, or in the Americas, where the coastal mountain ranges actually don't run north-south, uh, they run east-west. And so what happens is you get all of this cool Arctic air that comes down through the, uh, through the current, and because it's exposed totally, you get a really large diurnal temperature. Like if you're there in the morning or noon, it can be sort of fog covered and it can be about, you know, 10 or 12 degrees. And you, you know, if you're still there at three or four in the afternoon, it can be upwards of 20, 28 or 30 degrees. So you get this really diurnal temperature. And so Lafond, actually, there's a Canadian uh, connection here. Uh, Pierre Lafond uh, was born in Montreal and uh, he f founded this winery in 1975. But he was a real pioneer here because his first winery was called the Santa Barbara Winery. 
He founded it in 1962 and was the first winery since Prohibition to be, uh, to be opened in the Santa Barbara area. So this area here is really one of the most exciting regions now for Pinot Noir. Um, about 65% of all vineyards are dedicated to Pinot Noir and you see them a lot on these single um, uh, labels as single vineyard wines because there's about 80 different vineyards and they can all express sort of different characteristics, whether they're you know, more closer to the coast or a little further inland where it's gonna be a little warmer. There's different types of soils here as well and all of these clones. So Pinot Noir is really this great wine that is not deeply colored, yet it has this great ability to transmit this idea of terroir. And I always tell people, don't always judge a wine by its cover, by its color, sorry. Uh, so here we have the Domaine Lafon Pinot Noir from the Santa Rita Hills. I am Usha Khosla, and I am presenting this piece of sculpture that was bought to celebrate the centenary of the Granite Club. It was bought in 1976. There are some pieces of art that draw you towards them and compel you to look at them closely. For me, one such piece of art at the Granite Club is this polished cast bronze sculpture titled Hedra by the British sculptor Barbara Hepworth, or more appropriately, Dame Jocelyn Barbara Hepworth. She was born in 1903 in Wakefield, Yorkshire, England, and over a span of five decades, built a brilliant career as a sculptor. From 1925 to 1975, she was a leading figure on the international art scene as, uh, and produced 600 pieces of sculpture in wood, metal, and stone that are remarkable in range and emotional force. She also produced 80 drawings in chalk, ink and pencil of hospital operating rooms, delved in fabric design and printmaking, and in her late career, experimented with lithographs. After 1951, she began to work in bronze and clay. Barbara Hepworth was gifted with the special vision of an artist from a young age. In a BBC film made on her, she said, quote, all my memories are of forms and shapes and textures. Moving through the landscape with my father in his car, the hills were sculptures, the roads defined by forms, unquote. A, scholar took her, a scholarship took her to the Leeds School of Art and thereafter another scholarship to the Royal College of Art in London. At both these institutions, she studied alongside another bright and renowned York born, Yorkshire born sculptor, Henry Moore. They remained good friends for life and developed a friendly professional rivalry for many years. Reciprocal in influences were important factors in the parallel development of their careers. Though both sculpted pierced figures, Barbara Hepworth pioneered the method of piercing the block in 1931 and introduced emptied space as an element of her compositions. Her early works are characterized by simplified naturalistic forms, but over the course of her career, her style changed to purely abstract and geometric shapes. Inspiration for use of abstract shapes in her sculptures and drawings, she said, came from nature. Another inspiration was ancient architecture and monuments from Greek amphitheaters to the Bronze Age standing stones of men and tall in West Cornwall. What also inspired her move from figurative to abstract forms was some of the European avant-garde movements 
and a membership of the Abstraction Creation Group, both of which were important influences on her work. However, in her abstract forms, her works continued to maintain a visual affinity with the human form. Another European avant-garde influence on her was a direct carving method introduced by Constantin Brancusi around 1906. This method involved working directly in the chosen material instead of the traditional method of making preparatory models and maquettes and producing from them the finished piece of work. It allowed her to explore the innate rhythm of the material, which also let the heart of the stone shine through. In addition, it established a direct re relation with the living artist and the living material. She learned to carve in marble from the Italian sculptor Giovanni Ardini. In addition, she kept abreast of the European art scene and visited the studios of Pablo Picasso, Constantin Brancusi, and Jean Arp in Paris in 1933. She was keen to unite surrealism and abstraction in British art, and for this purpose, co-founded with her second husband, Ben Nicholson, and a few others, the movement Unit One. Nicholson's influence on her works was in the form of severe geometric pieces with the straight edges and immaculate surfaces such as this piece, head bra. Regarding casting bronze sculptures, she developed a technique of producing plaster models of the same scale as a final bronze and began by producing an armature of aluminum or chicken wire followed by the application of wet plaster of Paris, which she built up using either tools or her bare hands. When dry, she carved the surface of the plaster. Hepworth was married twice, first to the sculptor John Skeeping, with whom she had a son, Paul, and then to the painter Ben Nicholson, with whom she had triplets. Sadly, her son Paul Skeeping died in a plane crash in 1953 while serving in the Royal Air Force in Thailand. As a memorial to him, she sculpted what she called Madonna and Child, which stands in the parish church of St. Ives in Cornwall. At the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939, she moved with Nicholson and their children to St. Ives, which soon became the refuge and hub for many artists during the war period. From 1949 till her death in 1975, she worked in Trevon Studios in St. Ives. She died tragically in an accidental fire in the studio on May 20, 1975. Before her death, she was ailing with breast cancer. Her home and studio have been preserved as the Barbara Hepworth Home and Sculpture Garden, which is run by the Tate Gallery. In 1965, the British government conferred on her the title Dame Commander of the Order of the British Empire. Her sculptures were exhibited in the British Pavilion at the 25th Venice Biennale along the works of leading British artists, John Constable and Matthew Smith. Two museums are named after her, namely Hepworth Museum in St. Ives and the Hepworth Wakefield Museum in West Yorkshire, and both exhibit significant collections of her work. In addition, 34 art galleries and museums in Britain, the USA, and Australia exhibit her works. One of her most prestigious works is titled Single Form, which she made in memory of her friend 
and collector of her works, Dag Hammarskjöld, the former Secretary General of the United Nations. It stands in the plaza of the United Nations building in New York City. It was commissioned in 1961 by the former UN delegate Jakob Blaustein following the death of Dag Hammarskjöld in plane crash. Hepworth was born before the birth of feminism. As an artist, she faced greater hurdles than her male contemporaries, especially Henry Moore, with whom she was compared throughout her life and lived under his long shadow. Some art critics continued to look at her as Moore's public uh, pupil or to label her work as Moore-ish. They could not accept a sculpture of a baby son, Paul, carved out of a Burmese hardwood as her work because it was so non-Western in its portrayal and bore flavors of Picasso, Epstein, and Gaudier Bresca. Something they did not think that she, as a woman, could produce it. They coupled her with her husband, Skeeping, and said it was influenced by Moore. Her above-mentioned achievements came at some personal cost and with her fierce determination to keep her sculpture at the forefront and everything familial and emotional, including her personal papers, away from the public eye. She understood men as life's winners and marriage as a rite of passage, but expected to be accorded some kind of equality with men. At the Royal College of Art, her focus was winning awards, behaving like a real artist, and avoiding scandals or superficial ways of living. She ensured that the female voice in art was not only complementary to the masculine, but necessary for completeness. The Granite Club joins this illustrious list of Hepworth's art collectors. This is one of the few pieces of art that we have that is non-Canadian. This sculpture of her titled Hedra was sculpted in 1971 and is one of seven editions. Another edition of it is owned by the Art Gallery of South Australia. It is a polished cast bronze piece with a circular hole pierced through its center. The hole is enclosed within four sides of a rectangle and the sides meet at the top right corner only. The other three sides are rounded off and they seemingly soften the severity of the rectangle and the space enclosed. If we see, it gives it a kind of a tilt towards the right side of the uh, sculpture and it sort of brings in a movement in the piece of art. And as an onlooker, you have to keep moving to see through the hole, to see the whole space behind it. Like her other sculptures, this piece demonstrates her keen eye for balance and symmetry and her interest in the play of dualities between light and shadow and between the interior and exterior of form. This sculpture conveys her further belief that the negative space embodied by the whole is as significant as a solid mass around it, and it unites one side with the other. According to Catherine Menard, quote, the stability of the exterior slowly gives way as the contours slowly spiral downward. Cast shadows interact with gleams of refracted light through its space, accentuating the material's lustrous surface. The highly reflective surface of the bronze lends a, a celestial impression, capturing the warmth of shining light, reminding us of Hepworth's concern for material as an expressive for element of form." Unquote. It is in this light that we can understand its title, Hedra, a reference to the Egyptian sun god Ra, 
the destroyer of darkness. Her passion for the art form echoes in her following words, quote, I, the sculpture, am the landscape, I am the form, the hollow, the thrust, and the contour, unquote. So here we are in front of Head Ra, which is a very stunning sculpture by Dame Barbara Hepworth, who was this great, great British sculpture uh, artist. And I was thinking about this piece here, and I thought, well, what am I going to talk about? You know, we've talked about some of the other pieces about what I see in the art, but here I wanted to really dig in to the people behind the wines, uh, much like the person behind this art piece. Uh, now, Barbara Hepworth was a very strong woman. I mean, you heard earlier uh, about her having uh, triplets and you know raising triplets at a time when you know things were very difficult in you know the mid 20th century, early 20th century. And so I was thinking about a particular wine that I'm very passionate about and very partial to, uh, and that is the Glen Ely, uh, Cab Lady May Cabernet Sauvignon from Stellenbosch in South Africa. And Glen Ely is owned by a French woman, um, May Ilan de Lancassin, and she came from a very prominent Bordeaux family. In fact, she was born in Bordeaux in 1925 and grew up on a very famous Bordeaux estate called Chateau Pichon Lalande. And she was, which is one of the great uh, Bordeaux estates in Powiak, it's a second growth. And she had a very, very, does have, sorry, she's still alive. She has a very tremendous and interesting life. And so growing up in Bordeaux during the war, and there's a great book uh, that's out there called Wine and War that really documents some of the uh, things that went on in these famous wine regions like Burgundy and Champagne, Bordeaux and Alsace, and how the Germans were requisitioning tens of thousands of bottles a week from these places to be sent back to Germany. And so she grew up in this environment. She was a young girl and she was often would ride through the countryside uh, and she would get stopped by local German uh, military people questioning what she was doing. Um, and they always kind of commented, she always had these baskets of uh, sort of uh, fresh, fresh vegetables and you know, potatoes and carrots and things, which is ironic because Bordeaux, you very little grows other than vines. But what she was doing was uh, her family, her parents, um, were hiding two Jewish families at uh, Chateau Palmer, which was another estate that they owned. And she was taking these families fresh produce. Um, and so in the, uh, after the war, uh, she gets married and she marries a career military officer, Hervé de Lancassin, and she becomes a military wife. And she lives overseas and she starts to raise four children because at a time, you know, women in the wine business, even to this day, you know, women make up a, a, min a minority of winemakers and owners. Uh, but it was very different back then where it was a purely male-dominated industry. And so she goes off, but in 1978, the family calls her back to take over Chateau Pichon Lalonde. And she comes back and promptly oversees one of the greatest sort of renaissance and rejuvenations of a Bordeaux Chateau. Uh, and by the time she sells it in 2006 to the Rousseau family, it is one of the really top you know, five, maybe 10 Bordeaux producers uh, making some, you know, some of the greatest wines in the world. Um, and so the reason that she sold the estate, because she had four children, none of them wanted to be in the business. And she was, you know, sort of getting on in years and um, was, you know, France has some very punitive inheritance taxes as well. And um, so she decided to sell to the Rousseau family from Champagne, uh, who are a very uh, prominent family who own a number of estates throughout France. And so, but in the early 90s, she had become friends with this gentleman, Dr. Anton Rupert. Uh, who was a South African businessman and a vigneron. And if you know anything about sort of South African history, you know there was a very bleak period of almost 60 or 70 years of apartheid. And so in the mid-90s, uh, when reform comes along and Mandela's released, you have this uh, industry that is, although we call it a new world country, uh, in that we sort of separate old world countries, which are, you know, anyone that had a king and a queen, so uh, countries in Europe, those are the old world countries, versus new world, sort of like, you know, California or Canada or, you know, Australia. Well, interestingly enough, South Africa has a very long viticultural history. Uh, the first vintage was actually in 1659. So when you think about it, it's not really a new world country. 
Uh, and so as the industry was starting to come alive, uh, it had been obviously with the sanctions and things, they had no access to quality equipment, uh, materials and things. So the industry was in a real state of disrepair. And uh, Dr. Rupert believed that having some outside people come in would really help spur the industry. And because if, if you get a Bordelais person coming into your region, that really says something about the potential. If they believe in it, then you know the future could be very uh, could be very bright. And so she buys this uh, estate in 2003, um, just years before she sells. But she really didn't really know what she was going to do with it. And so what do you do at 78 when you've kind of got time on your hands and a lot of money in the bank? You actually go ahead and take on your next project. And so Glen Ellie Estate, which is a 300 acre property, it was a fruit farm originally, uh, so no vines were planted. And it was part of the original land grant to uh, Simon van der Stel, who was the Cape's first governor. So it is a very long, long history. And Stellenbosch, if you've ever been to uh, South Africa, is really just about 40 minutes outside of, uh, of Cape Town. And it's really ground zero for the South African wine industry. And so she went about creating this fabulous estate on this very uh, beautiful mountain called the Simmonsburg Mountain. Uh, and the one thing, I've been to South Africa on three occasions, it is probably the most you know, cinematic region in the world. It's utterly gorgeous and beautiful. And so she started building this estate. And so the wine that I picked today is called Lady May, which is the flagship. Uh, it is a Cabernet Sauvignon dominant blend, uh, about 90% Cabernet. And interestingly, it's only released uh, about five years after the vintage when they feel that it's sort of ready to drink. Um, and so, you know, we often talk about wine uh, being such a cultural part of lives and things, but wine and art, as we've seen here since I think 2013, when we first started doing this, you know, is a very big cultural part of the Granite Club. And um, May has one of the foremost um, glass collections in the world. She has about 500 pieces on display at the Glen Ellie Estate, uh, some going back over 2,000 years. And so you really see this connection between art and art and wine. But I would say uh, her, probably her greatest legacy, if you talk to her, uh, and she's still very vibrant. I saw a YouTube video of her recently. Uh, she would say that having four children, 10 grandchildren, and 14 great-grandchildren would be her greatest legacy. So we're going to raise a glass to all those great women out there. I'm Usha Khosla, reading the research and presentation written by Barbara Alexander. She says, it is my pleasure to be speaking about a piece of art and the history uh, of surrounding her art. First, Irene Avalakiak was born in 1941 in Nunavut and has become one of Canada's foremost Inui graphic artists. Her art is rooted in lived experience, often dealing with themes of being an orphan and Inui stories her grandmother told her. She is noted for her drawings, prints and wall hangings. She started with soapstone uh, carvings, often of animals and human heads. She was awarded an honorary doctorate by the University of Guelph in recognition of a contribution to the development of Inui art and a leadership role in the Nunavut community of Baker Lake. In her work, myth and reality merge with scenes of transformations, which she expresses in large, brightly colored abstract work. In Yellow Fish Woman, bird spirits form a double border around a central fish woman. The border figures, a signature of, of Avalakiak's wall hangings, represent spirits of the land and air. In the way we might see a face in a cloud, Avalakiak explains that the tundra sometimes reveals the faces of spirits, protectors to those who travel alone on the land. Color is very significant and the background suggests a sunshine scene where long shadows 
play tricks on the eyes and the spirits begin to stir. The wall hanging is an excellent example of a best known medium of wool duffel and felt with embroidery thread. It has been said that paintings of the past are reflecting a subject, whereas modern art brings about discussion. When starting to research this piece of art, I realized that this is certainly one where one can see a depth to the art that is not evident if you see it in passing. When I looked up yellow fish woman on the internet, the first thing to come up was a school of yellow fish. Then when looking at this piece of art, I thought of it showing the relationship of a group and the essence of the central figure uniting the group and the outer figures looking after the inner ones. It is also interesting that the position of the head brings together the cohesiveness of the group. I am sure that each one of us that spends time analyzing this piece in the Granite Club will come up with another feeling and wishing we knew more of Inui mythology. Please pause next time you are at the club to enjoy it. And here we are in front of our last painting, Yellow Fish Woman by Inuit artist Irene Avalakiak. And this is a very interesting piece uh, when I came up here to look at it, and I was really struck by a number of things. First of all, it's real mystic sort of quality. If you look at it here, we have these sort of images that are, are half uh, animal, half human, which is, uh, you know, not so... Um, you know, not so crazy when you think about Irene's upbringing, being uh, a nomadic Inuit, living their lives, moving around from sort of hunting camp and fishing camp throughout the, according to the seasons. And I read where she had not even seen a white person until she was 15. So the Inuit live in these really small communities, often just several families sort of clustered together where everyone relies on one another and things are, um, children are taught and the, the, are, are through oral history, uh, nothing is really written down. And so when I was thinking about this piece, I was thinking about this sort of semi-nomadic existence, uh, but also the mystical quality of, of the art as well. And I thought about biodynamics which uh, you know, we, we you might have heard talk about biodynamics in wine. Certainly we know about organics in our daily life uh, in terms of how you grow fruits and vegetables and things like that. Well, biodynamics has been around since uh, the 1920s. And it was a philosophy promulgated by this Austrian sort of philosopher. Uh, he was sort of a jack of all trades. He did many different things uh, who really believed in taking sort of the, the farm or the vineyard uh, the ecology as a whole. So it's a real sort of spiritual way of, of farming, if you will. Uh, and, uh, you know, you, we start to see more and more of it over the last sort of decade or two decades in the wine industry. Um, but there's some very mystical elements about it that uh, are hard for anybody, you know, from a, a pure hard science background to, to understand. Um, and so biodynamics is really the philosophy of not using sort of chemicals or in, uh, in your vineyards, which unfortunately chemicals are uh, a part of grape growing um, in very uh, sort of humid areas or areas with a lot of rain. Um, you actually have to use things like copper sulfate. Uh, it's a mix to help, you know, combat uh, molds and mildews and things. Whereas um, in, in biodynamics, they really eschew sort of all of these sort of chemical inputs into, uh, into the vineyard. And so I chose a producer uh, called Claudinel from the Loire Valley. And Claudinel is owned by um, a family called the Laflave family. And Anne Claude Laflave, uh, who ran and managed and owned this very famous Burgundy estate, arguably one of the greatest Chardonnay producers in the world, had converted to biodynamics over two decades ago. And there are things that are done in the vineyard according to the, sort of the lunar calendar, which, you know, you think about is that sort of the mysticism or not? Um, there are different sort of preparations that are used. Um, the most common one being preparation 500, where this special compost 
is, um, is created, is mixed in with cow horns, and planted in the vineyards uh, at a particular time in the lunar cycle, and also removed from the vineyards as well. And there's other preparations. There's about nine different preparations that are involved in this. And in the, in the biodynamic world, there's also these um, different days where producers will do certain things according to the kind of day it is, whether it's a leaf day, a fruit day, or a root day, there are certain tasks that are done in the winery around, around this belief. Um, it makes up a real small proportion of, I think, the global wine world. Uh, a lot of producers, you know, um, work very holistically, especially in the old world when you have small producers, they farm what's called lut raisonné, which means reasoned viticulture. And these are people that grew up on the land, right? And so they're not going to, you know, damage the soil, the, the land itself, because that is ultimately what gives the vine life. And so um, the Lafley family found this estate in the Loire. And if you've ever cycled through the Loire, it's one of the most beautiful regions in the world. Uh, lots of uh, very large castles. It was kind of the summer playground for uh, French royalty and in the, um, you know, in the 18th, 17th, 18th, 19th century. And so we have a lot of these beautiful castles. And it's a thousand kilometer long river. And it empties into the Atlantic Ocean in Nantes. And you have all of these different regions or appellations sort of spread along this thousand kilometers. And if you've ever had a Muscadet, you know, that comes from an area right around Nantes. If you've ever had a Sancerre, that's a Sauvignon Blanc from uh, the central part of the Loire, more further inland. And this wine comes from um, a uh, region called Anjou. Uh, and it is uh, about 30 kilometers sort of from Angers, which is you know, one of the great sort of medieval uh, towns in, uh, in and along the Loire. And definitely well worth a stop if you ever go. And so this is from a great variety called Cabernet Franc. And Cabernet Franc is a variety that, you know, we do pretty well here in Niagara. We don't see a lot of it around the world, but it's a blending grape. So if you've ever had Bordeaux or California Cabernet, chances are there's going to be some Cabernet Franc in there. Uh, and as a blending variety, it adds a little bit of sort of spice to it, a little bit of floralness to it as well, and a little bit of freshness. Uh, because it doesn't get quite as ripe as Cabernet Sauvignon, so it can you know, help mitigate some of those richer flavors that Cabernet brings to the table. But in the Loire, Cabernet Franc is really an important variety, really in the center part. And uh, an area like Chinon, which is very famous uh, in its own right, is an appellation that focuses purely on, on Cabernet Franc. And so this is, Claudinel is a small estate. Um, back in about 2008, uh, Anne Claude and her husband created this marketing association to try and help small producers who were practicing and farming biodynamically to be able to get out there and get their message out and be able to sell their wines. And she came across this estate that the uh, previous owners had unfortunately fallen on some hard times and so they ended up buying it. So it's a really beautiful estate uh, focusing on Cabernet Franc but also on Chenin Blanc which is one of the great wine, uh, white wine varieties of the Loire Valley. And so I was really kind of struck immediately by this kind of mysticism in the Inuit art, uh, the fact that uh, Inuit sort of are semi-nomadic and in biodynamics you have this sort of cycle where you do things according to, so there's a little bit of sort of similarity there. Um, but ultimately it was really just about, you know, finding a wine that really spoke to this idea of, of an alternate way of viticulture. Um, and so I went with the Claudinel and I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight and I want to thank all the members for coming and for giving their time and really enlightening uh, all of us uh, about the art pieces and um, although doing it virtually was not how we envisioned it uh, this year, we certainly hope that we'll be able to do it in person in 2023.